uh, it's a nonstop business, and it is. Uh, and and if I don't seem stressed, then I mean that's a, kind of amazing because <laughs> I definitely feel stressed some of the time. Um, but I think I've always been pretty good at managing that, and you know I think that I don't really know what to attribute it to, but there there comes a point in almost every project, every time we open something. There's a, there's a moment. It's usually like three days before opening or five days before opening when everything is happening at once, you know. And it's it's so stressful, and I and it's so it's just lots of anxiety. Is this going to work? We're putting so much into right. it. So many moving parts. So many people running around. So much money flying out the door. <laughs> and uh, you know, I always and I just get to this point where I say, I I know I've said this before, but this time I mean it. I'm never doing this shit again. <laughs> I'm never going to do this again. Michael Babin is most widely known as the founder of Neighborhood Restaurant Group, which he founded in 1997 and has grown to 19 locations. If you live in the DMV, it's almost impossible that you haven't visited one of his restaurants or shops. Here is the current list, although I'm sure there are more in the works. Iron Gate and DuPont, Eat Bar on Barracks Row, Vermilion in Alexandria, Hazel in Shaw, The Sovereign in Georgetown, and Rustco in Boston, Evening Star in Del Rey, Birch and Barley in Church Key on 14th Street, Blue Jacket in Navy Yard, The Partisan, Columbia Firehouse, Buzz Bakery, Red Apron Burger Bar in Union Market, Owens Ordinary, B-Side, Planet Wine Shop, and a multi-unit dining concept on Penn Ave. Michael is also a board member of Think Local First and co-created the shop made in D.C. with local favorite Stacy Price. He's consistently championed small business and those who take that risk by working with local vendors from top to bottom. Michael also founded and serves as chairman of the board of directors for the Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture, a 501c nonprofit dedicated to making positive change to the food system in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding region. This includes a mobile market, a veteran farmer program, and a farm to school program. What makes Michael stand out is his commitment to quality in everything he does. And it's not just him. His passion is unifying because he is the best team on the ground that is filled with legitimate superstars, all of whom are incredibly humble, not to mention loyal and forget about talented. Whenever asked about his success and his methods, the answer is always the same. My amazing team. Michael has been described as having an uncanny ability to make calculated risks that pay off in a big way. When asked, What's the best thing about D.C.? He answered, it's a city of idealists and big dreamers. A relentless trailblazer and family man with his feet on the ground and his favorite record playing in the background, please welcome Michael Babin, the only man in D.C. without a LinkedIn profile. Wow, that's a great intro. I got to get a copy of that. I know. I'm, I'll send it to <laughs> send you, it man. To my mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, well, thank you for being on the show, man. I'm super. I thank mean, you, I've, Molly. I've been such a fan of yours for such a long from from the day that I met you. Um, you know, you you do have an incredible, incredible team yeah, yeah. Um, of just amazing people. You know. Thank you. Thank um, you. I feel the same way, and I'm a big fan of yours too, as you know. Oh well, thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. A couple of people were like, "I can't believe you got a meeting with 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 Babin. I'm no, like, "Yeah, whatever. man. You know, I'm working on it." But yeah, you know, I just um, you know, the lower third, the podcast is really all about just kind of like digging deep with the relentless. Like, what is it that drives you? And so I kind of just wanted to like, you know, talk about some of that stuff. You know, like um, growing up in Baton Rouge. Yeah. You know, you want to tell us a little bit about sure. about that? Yeah, I grew up in Louisiana in Baton Rouge, uh, and. Uh, it was very different. I think about it all the time because I've got four kids. You know, the youngest is seven, and my oldest is eighteen, and they're growing up in a different world. Uh, and so, yeah. you know, the only <laughs> two words that come come to mind is free range. You know, growing up in <laughs> Baton Rouge, it was very different. Uh, and we we you know from a very early age could go you know headed out of the house every day and did whatever I wanted to, riding the bike as far away as I could get, uh, you know, and just roaming around and and doing whatever you want. Uh, which, you know, I mean, there are good reasons why we put a lot of limits on those kind of things now. I, I understand that, and I can't, I can't say that I advocate doing that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, if, you, if, you, if you manage to survive it, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, and uh, it definitely, uh, I think, sets a tone of just sort of being adventurous, you know, and, and wanting to uh, go out and see what's out there, you know, make a plan, go do it on your own, you know. 
So, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that it is like uh, your Baton Rouge roots? Is that where you got your love of food and and that passion? Is yeah. that well? I think you know when you grow up in Louisiana. I mean, it, it's it's sort of a cliche, but people really do. They 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 talk about lunch at breakfast. They talk about dinner at lunch. It's people think about food all the time. They take <laughs> I it can very relate. seriously. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I had uh, I had great um, uh, you know sort of French Cajun side of the family. They were amazing cooks, and they cooked certain things over and over again. And they they, they had kind of a like a repertoire, and then they would, you know, do do the special things every now and then, things that take even more work, you know. But these are dishes. Some of these dishes take like two days to make. And then I also had a Sicilian grandma, who was, uh, uh, you know, just sort of legendary in the family. I mean, it, you know, she was an incredible cook, and she would cook. She would start cooking on Thursday uh, during the day, and by Sunday she would have made just huge batches of food. She would go around to every family member's house and she would drop off food. Usually it would, you know, pack, you know, just sort of totally wrapped top to bottom in uh, in uh, tin foil and in, but in, in like empty cigarette cases because that she was a big smoker. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> <laughs> she was her delivery box. It's so Italian. <laughs> and, uh, so Italian. And, uh, you know, just amazing food. And uh, she would sit around and talk all day. I learned later that, you know, in the little villages in Italy, uh, these everybody lives around the grandma and everybody goes to to her house on Sundays and she cooks for everybody so in a in a you know automobile culture she was sort of reversing that and sort of come bringing it out to us right but those were indelible you know uh experiences and, and so we always just had a fridge full of amazing homemade food i bet uh and even today my mom who lives alone my, my dad passed away She's got a full size fridge, another full size fridge, a full size freezer, <laughs> and a small fridge, <laughs> and they're all full of food. That's crazy. <laughs> Just in case, like Just 100 people show up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's amazing. That's, that's super cool. So, is that, uh, you know, I know, you know, it's very obvious that you're very passionate about food. You wouldn't be, you know, this many restaurants deep if you didn't really care about it. Yeah. Um, but what I don't think a lot of people know is like how passionate you are about music. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people do. Like B side is like definitely an yeah. expression of that. Sure. Um, but it's rare to find somebody who's a restaurateur of your yeah. extent, you know, who isn't also delved into music. And so, right. you know, where did where did that passion come from? Yeah, I don't. You know, it just started really young. I think it was probably a little bit of. Um, that kind of ability to explore, you know, when I was a kid, I was started going. I went to my first concert when I was in third grade, and uh, my we had I had a friend who had a, an older sister who was two years older, so she would have been in like fifth grade. And our parents, you know, dropped us off, and we went into the show. And at the end, we came out, and she, you know, dialed on the payphone, and my parents came and picked us up. Right. <laughs> so it was like it's so crazy, right? Yeah. Um, different planet so i went to a few shows as a kid and then in the sixth grade as a young kid and then in the sixth grade i saw the who oh, and that was man. like in 1980 yeah. you know since dates me but uh that was <laughs> they were still young enough to move around and jump you know right. and, uh, <laughs> it was still interesting so yeah. it was um that was a that was like a shock to the system you know it was like yeah. wow and it was so much power and uh and then um you know from there you know Saw an incredible Bruce Springsteen shows. I got into the clat, got into the, you know, so I hit that moment in the 80s where punk got just sort of mainstream enough so like a suburban kid could totally get into it. Right. There were a few little bands in Baton Rouge doing their thing and, uh, and just started, you know, going to the record store all the time and, uh, listening to all of the you know the independent radio stations and just write you know it's like scribbling down the names of the band and go to the record store and you know just getting into being a fan and, yeah. and, and, and loving it so much you know so it's never really gone away I just you know I, I really I mean as you you know better than anybody like the music business changes every six months so you has got to need a new business model to make a living in it but yeah uh, but as a fan <laughs> It's mostly gotten better, you know, it is a fan because you have access to everything. So much um, music, yeah. Yeah. And B-side is super cool for people who don't know. Like you play, you know, entire albums there, yeah, right? Yeah, like absolutely. that's it. And that and if I'm not mistaken, that's your collection there, right? A, a lot of them are. Some of them have disappeared, so we're sort of like oh, we're no. saying, yeah. Nate, the chef Nate and and I are, you know, we're buying records uh uh now for it specifically. Right. Yeah, but um but yeah, no, I mean, I think probably like a like a lot of people, uh, you know, I started with uh, 
records and tapes. That was what you could get back then and then move through all the different things. And of course, it's so amazing yeah. when you can make a, a playlist that, that's like 48 hours long of every song that you want to hear ever, you know? Right. But then at some point you realize why these records matter, you know, is because not all of them, because there's a lot of junky music records, you know, with one hit and a bunch of junk, right? Right. But great albums are made. There, you know, every song is the sequence and the whole picture is yeah. it flows together. And it's an inconvenience to have to go flip it. But I feel like it, it kind of it, it, it never quite lets you disengage. You know, it keeps you as an engaged listener. It's like an activity you have to do. You have to go flip that record. You're paying attention more, yeah. you know. And I think music become, you know, in the digital age, music becomes kind of wallpaper for a lot of people. For and, sure. Uh, it's never been like that for me, so. For sure, yeah. I mean, I remember, you know, my first record, uh, yeah, it was so long. I was playing on my Fisher Price record player, you know. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting time. Like, I think, you know, we're in the same generation, I'm pretty sure. And it's like, you know, we're super lucky because we had, like, you know, mom and dad had an eight track player, <laughs> oh my God, you yeah. know, and then what was the things that the, uh, or wait, was that the eight? No, we had a reel to reel in wow. the house. Well, you were, you were very lucky. That's and the real deal. Yeah. <laughs> for real. And then eight track in the car, in the yeah. Pinto. Oh my God. I know. <laughs> we're lucky I'm alive, yeah, honestly. Yeah, totally. Like, little death trap. Um, but, you know, just to live through that era, it's like, you know, yeah. born in the 70s, so, like, that was the background, like, right. when I was a baby, and then 80s music, and then yeah. 90s hip-hop. I mean, right. like, come on, man. Like, I know. You know. I graduated high school in 93. That was, like, the golden era Absolutely. of hip-hop. Absolutely. Totally. I no, read to I some of my uh, staff members, like, just the top 100 hip-hop hits in 93, yeah. and yeah. they, like, couldn't believe it. Yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, that's why I'm so cool. <laughs> that's it right there, you know? Absolutely. But, um, so, so let's talk about D.C., Yep. Dude, man, what yeah. a, what a weird world we're in now, huh? Yeah, a lot absolutely. has changed since. Uh... Oh my God, everything has changed. You know, when when we first opened, uh, the first restaurant was the Evening Star, uh, out in in Delray, where I lived then and still live in Delray neighborhood of Alexandria. And <clears throat> you know, back then I had been working as a lobbyist, and so my experience of DC restaurants was either you know, the little joints that I could afford to go to, or when I'm using the lobbyist card, I'm going to the big French places that right. and steakhouses and stuff that really defined uh, the DC dining culture back then. It For was sure. all about these sort of, um, you know, impressive, very traditional, very stodgy um, places. Some of them had great chefs working in them, um, but the whole scene was kind of uh, like i said it's kind of uh, overstuffed and very narrow yeah you know? um and so when we got into it what we were really interested in was finding young talented chefs and you know with some guidance and some some guardrails <laughs> kind of taking you know taking the reins off and really letting them do their thing and 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 you know and and saying listen we just want you to buy great ingredients we want you to uh, learn from mistakes, you know, we <laughs> want you to pay, pay attention to the guests. Don't just cook the food that you want to eat, but, you know, but cook the food that you want to eat and that you think other people are going to enjoy. And let's really, exp let's, let's create something that is more local. That's more true to this town and this place and living in the mid Atlantic. What do we have around here? That is great. You know? Right. Um, so that was really the idea is really simple, straightforward. But at the time it was, it felt kind of radical because you know the places that were pitched at the neighborhoods were, you know their can their food was coming out of cans and bags, right? And the um and the and then you had the the super high end places that were doing very traditional fussy food. Mm -hmm. So to do you know real food made from real ingredients that you're sourcing really carefully from local sources, uh, you know with real thought and passion behind it teams in the kitchen that really care and are laying it out there every day. Right. Um, that was pretty radical. Uh, and now, you know, and this is a good thing. It's every, that's the norm. Yeah. If you, you know? can't do that, you're not going to yeah, survive. Yeah. I mean, look, there's still places that, um, maybe look, uh, a little bit more, uh, made from scratch. And in behind the scenes, there's always going to be places that are run like big chains. And some of them are big chains. Some of them are just run like big chains, but, you know that is that part of the food world to the people who really care in the city is kind of irrelevant right and where you used to have a dozen or or 20 or 25 good options in that in that 
meaningful uh, category. Now you've got hundreds, and it's, it's crazy. awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think like at one point I was doing research. I mean, this is years ago on how many bars and restaurants there were, and it was like three hundred and twenty-five. Yeah. I don't remember how long ago it was, yeah. but it wasn't like 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it wasn't yeah, that long ago. Yeah, yeah. Now, what is it? I mean, uh, I don't even know. It's, I mean, we've been adding them at such a crazy, furious insane. pace. Insane. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I mean, there's a, it's a tough business, you know, I mean, it's a tough business. So I see some, I see, and, and look, we, we've been, we've done this too, you know, but you, you have to be very careful. I mean, it is a business. And uh, there's, there, we probably passed the point a few years ago where, the restaurant growth was outpacing the population growth. You know, the, the addition of seats right. was outpacing the guests who would be going to them. And so the industry got, you know, uh, tough at that point. We've seen a lot of closures and for stuff sure. like that. And I think that's probably going to continue for a while. Um, it'll right size itself eventually. But, you know, uh, it, from a dining perspective, it's incredible because you just have this so many endless, I, I know, it's nonstop. And so. so much good food. Uh, it's really, it's absolutely right. And like everything is expensive, so you might as well get the really good stuff because yeah. <laughs> you're going to pay a lot, way too much money for the not so great stuff anyway. So you you're might right. as well level up and yeah. like really go in. Yeah. Yeah. Even just the amount of like vegetarian or vegan oh, or just yeah. healthy places. You know, I lived in totally. California for a couple of years and was like, whoa, all these like yeah. <laughs> healthy, yeah. convenient options. Yeah. And then you started to see it more here in DC. And absolutely. now it's like everywhere, right? Yeah. And now it's. Well, California has got, and it, you know, is lead has always led the way with, in regard to some ways, and that's that's a big one. You know, part of it is just that when you look at where, you know, food is grown, a lot of the food that we love to eat, a lot of it is grown in California. You know, if it's not right. if it's not staples, if it's not you know grains and uh, the kind of heartland stuff, it comes from California. A lot of it, that's where it, that's the home base. So chefs and restaurants operating in those places have this incredible luxury. You know. Now it's starting to change because uh, small farms are, you know, having something of a resurgence around the country. And, yeah, and chefs are going out and sourcing. They're telling them, you know, uh, and and we've been a big part of this from the beginning. Is going out and and not just sort of looking at what the farmers are growing and saying, "Oh, we'll take that and that," but actually telling them, "If you grow this, we'll buy we'll, it. We'll buy it." Right. So let's let's start to change this. And that's something that Arcadia has been really involved in. Uh, you know. Uh, just really trying to get the chef community to influence the farmers, uh, changing what they grow, Makes sense. And the way they think about it, you know. Yeah, and then it, and then it changes what's available on the plates in 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 in, uh, in restaurants, and gradually it starts to change what people want to order from the grocery store and what their kids are being exposed to. So, it has a you know it's a big impact. But I, and I think restaurants, you know, should take seriously the obligation to kind of be a leader in that because mm -hmm. they can plant seeds, you know, figuratively and literally that that really can uh, can make a difference. So. You know, I recently met um, the guys from Pete and Jerry's Eggs, mm -hmm. um, and they were a small farm, been around for like 30, 40 years, something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were starting to get outsourced and, you know, beat up by these huge farms with, you know, five million hens and all sure. these things. Right. Um, and they were about to go under and they thought, you know, let's switch to organic. And yeah. that worked. And then what they did is they formed a network of all like I think yeah. it's like I want to say like 150 or 120 mm -hmm. other small family farms. Right. And that's those are Pete and Jerry's eggs. Wow. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's a very common sort of so approach. So smart, yeah. you yeah. know. So no, now all smart. these farms were able to survive yeah. and now they're creating really great products. And even like egg farmers, chicken farmers, like when they run out of eggs, they, they'll buy them because mm -hmm. they're like, these are like the only real eggs on right. the market. Yep. And they're a little more expensive, but... It's awesome to know that, like, when you spend that money, it's actually going to a small farmer. Yeah. Like, it's not going to like no, whoever, right? Yeah. You know. No, I mean, you know, the I think the statistic is that if everybody b was willing to pay, like, a, a, I think it's less than a dime uh, per pound of food of, of fresh food, you know, a, a dime more per pound than everybody working in the uh, in the food business, down to the pickers, could right. earn a, could earn a living wage, you know. So. Uh, you know, the hard part is if we all just if if <laughs> if somebody added a dime to every you know would it actually make it to those people, right? Uh, but it, it you know small amounts of money if we're willing to pay to put our money where our mouth is, uh, you know literally to do to 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 make changes, then it doesn't take massive amounts. Right, you know, it takes little bits that get to the right places. You know, 
That's a good point. You know, um, I feel like people are willing to pay more, but they want it conveniently, right? Yeah. I think that's it. Like, yeah. they'll, you'll give Amazon a right. few extra dollars, you know, yeah, yeah, f- for that quality. It just has to show up really fast, right? Uh, like, well, yeah, people, we're all getting hooked on something that is like it's crazy. I think about you know, I talk to my kids all the time, explaining to them. How you know? I grew up in a world where there were three channels on the TV station. And if you wanted to watch a movie, right. you either you know uh, you, <laughs> you either saw it at the theater or you waited and hoped and prayed it would finally come in and some right. BS version packed with commercials <laughs> yeah, and missing exactly. all the best parts. You yeah, know, exactly. But if you want to yeah. watch Mash or like Porky's Revenge, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, you're, you're totally like, cool. Why yeah. were those always on? <laughs> What what? Oh man! So um, so that kind of leads me to my next question. We kind of covered it a little bit, but like uh, in two thousand and nine, which is ironic because it's ten year anniversary of this. You said I don't think DC's diners desires have changed much in ten years, but I think they've become more educated in the dining experience. So do you think? Well, I think we already kind of talked about it. Other than that, I mean, I think definitely that's impacted what we're dealing with now. People, I mean, do you think there's? This is a good question to ask. Do you mm-hmm. think that like people? Like, where do you think the majority of D.C. residents or DMV residents are getting their food? Are they going out more? Are they cooking in more? Like, yeah. where does that balance well, live, a, you, you know? know that, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. I mean, I think that um, people people eat out a lot, you know. I mean, I think the D.C., one of the things about D.C. that is is sort of important uh, important factor is that it's a workaholic city, you know. Tell me people about it. People work so hard. And uh, I was just talking to somebody because I, I think New York is kind of a similar place. New York has a different thing because it's so it's like it's very nature is inconvenient. This, but um, guy I know was telling me about his son who lives in New York and he goes there and he's you know well off guy's doing well uh, lives in uh, Brooklyn and his fridge is just empty. You know he doesn't have time and right. he, he doesn't you know <laughs> he doesn't have a car. Uh, so th- that's being influenced by a different thing to some extent, but. Uh, but when you live in a workaholic city, you know people want the nice kitchen and they want they want to go to the, they <laughs> right. buy the food a lot of times they go to the grocery store. Right. But on any given Tuesday night or Thursday night, they're wiped out. And uh, yeah, you know it, where we are right now is you can you know the food that you can have delivered to you is every different type of food. <laughs> you know, Uber eats, <laughs> yeah, man. it's crazy. Uber eats. But, it's, uh, uh, but you know, it, 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 it. I was just thinking that like. I don't want to do Uber Eats, but like if I've been here since 10 a.m. Yeah. And my last meeting is at 9 yeah. 30. Yeah. Like, how am I supposed to? I mean, how many meals am I supposed to bring to the studio in yeah. the morning? Like, <laughs> right. how prepared can I possibly yeah. be? Like, I'm not that guy. You right. know what I mean? Right. I'm barely remembering to eat at all. Never yeah. mind bring three Tupperwares with food in it, you know? Totally. And so I'm definitely guilty of ordering Uber Eats here because I'm working, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I don't necessarily want to wait until I get home at 10 30, 11 o'clock to then eat, you know, yeah. right before bed. It's a, yeah. uh, it's a double edged sword. You it know? is. It is. Yeah. So um, what? Uh, so okay. So this is like the, the really fun part. So you know, I, I tell people about you all the time. Even my Uber driver on the way over, I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, man, Michael Pavney, super cool." And he, they, you know, just bragging about the whole organization and how yeah. awesome everybody is and yeah. how much you've done. And it's just like you know, what I what I always wonder about you is like you're just so humble. Like you're the chillest, most humble person mm-hmm. I've ever met in my mm-hmm. life. Like honestly, yeah. like super super cool, chill person, and. I feel like if I was you, I'd be like, I'm so fucking stressed. Like, I would just be freaking out. All I would not be chill. Like, yeah. I'm not chill now. I don't have 19 restaurants and three nonprofits and four yeah. children. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. freaking out over nothing, right? So it's like, how do you, like, how do you find that balance? And, like, what makes you, like, what makes you, why 19 restaurants? Like, why yeah. 15? Why 12? Like, right. it, it, it's not money that's no. driving you at this no. point. Like, there's no way. Like, there's no. some level of, like, sadomasochism on yeah. some level, right? No, totally. But, like, what what <laughs> what is that? Because, you know, like, yeah. I know there's days that just suck. I mean, I remember yeah. a couple years ago when the power went out in Virginia and your freezers went down oh, and you yeah. shared with me, like, how much food and it, yeah. and I like I that's stuck with me ever since. Like no one thinks about that. Like no one ever thinks about that stuff, right? When yeah. you really feel like your world is over, you just lost a quarter million in a day or whatever, yeah. right? Like shit happens, especially right. when you own so many things. So many so what is like what is yeah. that, you know? Yeah, no, it is it's a nonstop uh it's a nonstop business and it is uh and, and if I don't seem stressed, then I mean that's a kind of amazing because I definitely <laughs> feel stressed some of the time. Um, but I think I've always been pretty good at managing that. And, 
you know, I think that I don't really know what to attribute it to, but there there comes a point in almost every project, every time we open something, there's a, there's a moment. It's usually like three days before opening or five days before opening when everything is happening at once, you know, and it's it's so stressful, and I and it's so it's just lots of anxiety. Is this going to work? We're putting so much into right. it, so many moving parts, so many people running around, so much money flying out the door, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I always and I just get to this point where I say, I I know I've said this before, but this time I mean it. I'm never doing this <laughs> shit again. I'm never gonna do this again. And you know, you get it open and it's exciting, and there's you know that some of the you uh, if you're lucky, some good things come back. And you know, for me, like a month later, I just start feeling like I want to do something. I want to build. <laughs> I've got this idea, you know, <laughs> and. Uh, I think there's, yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I like to build stuff. I love, I love working with teams too. I love the people we get to work, I get to work with. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them make me crazy every now and then, but, and I know I make them crazy, but I love them. I, I really do. And so uh, that has been, I think, kind of the best part of it in a way is really just, uh, it's really, I mean, people think it's a food business, and it is, of course, right? There is that. Like, that's the end result. You know, we all, we eat the food. We, we drink the drink. But it is it is totally a, a people business, like For everything sure. else. It is 100% about uh, the, the kind of people you get to work with, the kind of people who are doing it, what kind of a feeling does do they create in the place yeah. where they work for their coworkers, for their team. And um, I love that part of it, you know? It's... Um, I know you're not, yeah, I guess you're not really supposed to have, you know, combine your social life and your work life or whatever, but I mean, give me a break. You know, all we do in the, in, in our business at least is it's hospitality. Right. We are social people. We're like, you know, uh, afflicted with extreme empathy, you know, and, and, <laughs> we, and so we're always in everybody else's head, you know, trying to figure out what they think about things. And it just, you know, so it's this, it's a, it's a social workplace always. Yeah. And, um, so I love that about it, you know, and uh, and I love, you know, taking an idea and, and making it happen. Like, that's what it's all about. For sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the joy and excitement of creating something that didn't exist before um, is uh, there's nothing like it, you know. So uh, that's why I do it, you know, and uh, I don't think it had to be restaurants. I just I kind of, you know, I love restaurants and I love going out and, right. I, you know, and I love. Uh, and I and I, I ended up loving the people in it. That was the part I didn't really understand was how much I would kind of relate to and enjoy the company of the people that the industry kind of draws naturally. Yeah. Uh, even though there's a little bit of crazy there, but I but it's <laughs> a crazy that I kind of like in general. And uh, but you know, it, it, but other than that, it, it could have been anything. I, I just want to build something that you you envision and then you get to see it happen. You know, that's joyful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's very well said. It's, it's, oh. it's obvious, you know, especially just the team you have around you, like yeah. they're still there. Right? right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. like that, I feel like that says everything, you right. know, the fact that the business is sustainable and that you have yeah. the same crew of people who you've been stressing out and they've been stressing you out, but you know, you're, you're all still there. And that's, absolutely. I think, and you have still, like I said in that intro, I mean, you do have, I mean, you know, you have so many rock stars. Yeah. I mean, we do have an amazing group and it, and it, and it, and it gets better, you know, I mean, over time, uh, and it's not to say like we I love it when we um, we did a uh, we had a party. I think it was a 15 year party at one of the restaurants. I won't say which one, but it narrows it down quite a bit. But uh, anyway, they had a um, it was 10 year. I can't remember. And uh, they had three. It, it, so they had the current employees were there and then they had name tags for regulars and friends. And then they had name tags for former employee <laughs> yeah. like left left ha left on my own and then they had right. for former employee terminated <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and every and, 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 and that last category had a bunch of people and the key thing was they came to the party right and we and we love them you know like things don't work out sometimes and people and people uh, that's the worst case scenario you, you know have to let somebody go for some reason but um but much more different and in, in, is that people move on and if you look, I love the yeah. fact that when we look around the city, we see people we used to work with everywhere. everywhere. I walk in the restaurant, any restaurant in town almost, and I see people that we've worked with. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're just awesome people. And they're moving on in their careers. And I, I always tell people, you know, 
look, you know, we wish you nothing but the best. We want you to be happy wherever you're going. Our job is to give you opportunities to keep growing and growing. Right. But if you if the best move for you is to move on, hell, you know, go do that. Yeah. We support you. And who knows? You know, maybe one day the paths lead back again and we get to do that. And that's happened several, many times. Right. You know? Right. People leave and they come back. It's great. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I know so many. I mean, yeah. you have uh, impacted you and your team have impacted the city's uh, hospitality industry so much. Uh, and I, I just, um, I, you know, I'm not necessarily like all into the industry talk and stuff, but I just feel like you are one of the most humble and just like, you know, not as discussed. I think you do a really good job of like keeping yeah. yourself out of that, you right. know, with that, yeah. like you're the only guy without a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> it's so amazing, honestly. Um, but like, you know, you have absolutely impacted the city in so many positive ways. I know so many people that have worked for you and like, I mean, think about all the awards that people have worked, uh, you know, have gotten while they worked with you, while they didn't work with you. Right. And you can really feel that like company yeah. culture, even from a distance, you know, everybody's willing to put in the work and do jobs. It might, might not necessarily be theirs, but everybody's got the same, right. you know, end goal in, in mind. And that's yeah. Awesome. Well, I think when when people get into this business, and what, this was happening right as we started the company, the you know twenty, uh, god, twenty two years ago, you could sort of see how the cult of personality was coming into the food world. You know, it was already there to some extent, but it was very nascent. You know, it was just starting. And they didn't have Top Chef and all the other shows. They didn't have all of these uh, these different media opportunities, but. It was really obvious then you could see like there were some businesses that were identified overwhelmingly with a personality, a single person and 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 uh, and others where the people you know other there was lots of spotlight to go around and um, and so that was a very conscious decision you know uh, was it's not about me, you know I want people to come uh, to work with me and be a colleague and a friend. Uh, and uh, partner, you know, uh, for the long term. And part of the deal is that people have to see a way that their hard work and the things that they do are going to be recognized. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, and it was it was not a hard decision. I didn't, I wasn't uh, ambitious to become, you know, have a bigger name or something like that. But that was a decision. It was like, you know, I, I want, I want to hire a chef and I want to be able to tell the chef part of our commitment to you is we're going to build your brand. We're mm -hmm. going to make people know that they're not just going to love that dish. They're going to know uh, the person who's cooking it. Absolutely. Or the person who, you know, put the put the drinks together tonight. Yeah. All of that is really important. And so whether you end up staying with us or doing something else, that you're going to your reputation, your brand is something that you're we're going to build with you, yeah. you know. And um then I think that that I'm like I like that, you know, about the company. I think the company has always been this, it really is a group, you know, it, it's not, we don't, I don't use that term lightly, it's not like, you know, corporation calls you and tells you what we're going to, you know, change the menu this week or anything right. like that, it's very much like, it's very collaborative, and the and there are multiple collaborative groups, and at every restaurant, there is, uh, there are a few people, uh, really a, a pretty large group of people, who are every day and night, they're breathing the life into that place, you know, Right. I'd say it's like a, a restaurant or any business really, but certainly a restaurant is like a balloon with a slow leak. You know, you got to reinflate, <laughs> you got to constantly reinflate it. And, uh, you know, mm. for the people who are laying it out doing that, um, hopefully loving it, you know, uh, they should get the credit for what they're doing. Um, they should absolutely. So. And then, you know, that, that's, uh, they, and there it is, you know, and that, that's what mm. it is. And, and it, when you said that, I mean, it's, it's the first time I ever knew who the chef was that cooked my food or the guy who picked my beer was at um, uh, Birch and Barley. Yeah. Birch, my yeah. favorite place yeah. on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. that place. Yeah, it's dark too. and awesome. And I don't even like beer. Yeah. But I drink beer when I go to Birch and Barley. <laughs> I do. I'm like, all right, give it to me. You know, There's a lot of people who, who didn't really drink beer before they go to, or, or maybe don't drink it other than when they go. And, yeah. we have a, and, and you know, and that's interesting you mentioned that. We have a, we have a young chef there, Jared Silver, just... Join the company. Super excited about him. And yes, I think I saw some of you guys are yeah. doing some menu changes over there. We just changed there. the menu. And, I gotta uh, go back. Yeah, no, it's it's exciting. It's just fun. It's a that is really fun for me is to see somebody because Jared's like a lot of the sh young chefs we have in the company right now. He's he's great, you know, and he really cares. He really brings. He's got great ideas, um, and so far he's he's been making great food. But you wouldn't know who he was, right? You know. 
at, in, in, in other companies. And, you know, uh, and, and, you know, anyway, now it's time, you know, it's time yeah. for him to, to step onto the stage and for people to know uh, who, who he is. Because yeah. he's got a hell of a vision. You know? Yeah. So it's pretty cool. I'll definitely have to make my way back there soon for sure. Yeah. yeah. I love that place. Yeah, I do too. So my, my last question for you is, um, and I have it written down here, is how do you want to be remembered? But I feel like that would be a little bit, like, that's, not the, that's not the question I want to ask. You know, what is, you know what is, what's the impact you want to have? Like, what's the legacy that you want to uh, instill? Like, what, yeah. you know, when people think of your name, what, what do you want them to, to think? Whew. Well, I mean, I think, you know, if you have kids, you can't help but think of your legacy attached to your children. So, I mean, I think that's sort of, you know, I know that's a cliche, but, you know, I, I can't really, I, I, that, my first thought is I want to be a good dad, I want to be a good husband, you know, I want to I want to be good at that. Um, I try to be. Um, I think that uh, on the on the restaurant and the, and the business side, I hope that I would be remembered as somebody who gave a lot of people a lot of opportunity, who did sort of in, in a bunch of small ways, like move the ball forward, push mm-hmm. things forward. You know, these things that are happening, these giant trends in food and everything else, they're going to happen. You know, like there's sort of there's a big trend. It's not, there's no one person who's going to change it, but they can happen better or worse, faster or slower. And I hope that I've helped that. You know, there are things that need to happen in the food system locally is why we started Arcadia. You know, I hope that that has a, a, a it's, it's already had a big impact on, on the lives of a lot of people, but I hope that continues. And you know, uh, how do you know when you have, you know, succeeded at something like that when it's no longer necessary? You know, when all the mm. stuff that you've done, you know, with Arcadia, you know, we hope our programs become totally right. obsolete. Right, because everybody know? has Because everybody has food. Everybody right. has good food on the, on the table. And everybody is, uh, you know, is we get rid of these crazy, easily avoidable nutrition-related illnesses that right. afflict mostly poor people. You right. Know? Um, so, you know, I mean, that's unlikely, but (laughs) we'll ever get there, but you know, that's the goal. Um, so, uh, you know, but anyway, so I, I hope that, um, the people that I get to work with, that I am privileged to work with and, and, uh, that they, you know, feel like they got a lot out of working with me, uh, whether they stayed in the company or moved on, that they, they see real success, real uh, enjoyment from what they did, um, real satisfaction. Um, so th- that would be it, you know, nothing, it's not nothing too, too nothing, big. It's not too grand, <laughs> you know? Uh, anyway, so th- that's probably it. And I lied. I have one more, one more question. Yeah, absolutely. What is your, like, what would na- like recommend one thing from one of your restaurants? Oh, like God, what's your favorite, so what's your favorite hard. food? <laughs> like, so even hard. if it's just right now or this yeah. week or whatever. Yeah. Where where should the listeners go? <laughs> I mean, as uh, obviously all of them. But. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, this has been around for a while now. Nate Anda is a good friend of mine who is the chef for for Red Apron, um, uh, and so that includes that we have a location in Union Market, we have the B side and a Red, Red Apron location out in Merrifield in Virginia, and we have the Partisan uh, in in DC, and. Um, so I think that um, this is just a total guilty pleasure food, but, you know, it, Red Apron cooks uh, all of their French fries in beef fat, which, because we got a lot of beef fat, which is, which is a real, uh, you know, whole animal butchery that Nate runs. And um, this is the way that McDonald's, this is, the, the reputation of McDonald's came from their fries, not their burgers. Their burgers were always blah. But their, right. but their fries were used to be incredible, and that's how they grew, because they fried them in beef fat. It's amazing. Uh, now, And they ended up abandoning that. Malcolm Gladwell talks about all this in, in a podcast. But right. They ended up abandoning that because of a kind of a public health crusade. <clears throat> now, of course, it turns out that it probably is actually more healthy <laughs> yeah. to eat fried foods that are fried in beef fat. Anyway, they're incredibly delicious. And then he has this burger that's called a, a, that's this triple stack, which you can get at the Partisan, um, maybe one of the other two restaurants as well. And it's uh, two beef patties and one chorizo patty, so it's a house-made chorizo. Oh, man. And then all the fixings. are So, so those fries, that burger, a really nice uh, cold beer, you know, uh, or even a glass of wine, you know, uh, is uh, it's a pretty nice 
really down to earth, really simple. It sounds know, amazing. I'm about to really go to the partisan yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. They're like, sorry, Panama, I yeah, got to get out of yeah. here. It's pretty, it's pretty memorable. Um, so anyway, but uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a tough question because obviously, you know, I don't want to show any bias here. And I, exactly. love, I, love, exactly. I love all these places and I, and, I, and I really love and respect the people who uh, work their hearts out at them. So I could go through all the restaurants and name stuff, but you know, I bet, that's I one. bet. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely put, uh, well, you know, in the video description, we'll put all the links and all the stuff to the restaurants oh, and awesome. link everybody to your website and, and all you. that kind of stuff. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for taking time to be here today. Molly, thank and, you so much. Oh man. Yeah, it's, thanks uh, for doing what you the, do. Oh, I appreciate you, man. I <laughs> yeah. appreciate you. It's, um, it's exciting to be here and, yeah. uh, thanks for taking the time. I really do appreciate of course. it. Of course. Awesome. Well, right. uh, that was the lower third folks and, uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you.